Welcome to the first real lecture of the course on data compression with deep probabilistic models. In the last video, I gave an overview of the things that you're going to expect from this course. And today we're going to jump right in. If you haven't seen the last video, click on the link to the playlist in the video description and it will take you quite right there. Today, we're going to see our first class of very simple compression methods, which are called symbol codes. But before that, I want to clarify the problem setting that, and this will be the problem setting that we'll be discussing in the entire, throughout the entire course. So the problem that we'll be dealing with is that of communication over a channel. So what do I mean with that? Well, we have two parties, a sender and a receiver. And the sender has some message and they want to send that message to the receiver. And in order to do that, they first encode the message, which is some transformation that they to do to this message. And then they take this encoded message and they send it through what we call a channel. The receiver then takes um, the output of the channel and it inverts the encoding step. So we call this decoding. And the decoding step then outputs a reconstruction of the original message. Okay, so this is a very general setup, uh, but there are a lot of different things can happen in each of these steps along this pipeline. So let's go th through each of these in more detail. Let's start with the message. Let's think of some example message, the messages that you might want to send to the, uh, to the receiver. You may want to send, for example, an, a, a digital file, like an image file or a text file. Um, but you may also want to send something that's not, that's more ephemeral, like for example, real-time video, think of a Zoom call or a Skype call. Another kind of message that you might want to send is, you know, think not at all about digital data at all, but imagine that the two of us are in the same room and that we're talking to each other. So the messages that we're then sending are kind of the utterances, you know, the words that we, that we talk, that we pronounce. So these are all different kinds of messages and they have different kinds of properties. So for example, they could be digital or analog, you know, computer files are digital, but for example, the, when we talk to each other, the, the, those are analog information, those are analog messages. Um, another important property of messages is that they typically have a very clear structure. So for example, if you're sending an HTML file to someone, then that HTML file has to follow the grammar of HTML. So um, you know that it will start with a doc type and then they, it will have this, uh, the string HTML in angular brackets and so on. And these, this kind of uh, structure that the message obeys um, leads to certain redundancies. So for example, this doc type and this beginning of the string HTML is something that you can expect. So um, it, it is kind of in some sense a redundant information. Okay, this is so far to the message. Now let's um, think about the channel. I think the channel is probably the most abstract thing so far in, in, in this entire pipeline. What do I mean with the channel? Well, you're probably thinking of something like the internet and to be more concrete, we're thinking of protocols like TCP or UDP. And that's of course a very important channel, but there are more uh, difficult, more, uh, uh, there's a much bigger variety of channels. So for example, the internet itself is actually a very complex system. And if you work at a company that builds um, networking uh, tools to build up uh, an, uh, a network infrastructure, then the channel that you are concerned with might be something um, more, um, more physical, like fiber optic cables. Um, another channel, Let's think again about the situation where the two of us are in the same room and we're talking with each other. And then the channel would be the sound waves that, uh, that are emitted by the speaker and then received by the ear of the, uh, the receiver. And finally, I want to point out one channel that you may not be thinking of as a channel, but it really makes sense to treat it in the same framework. And, uh, you know, think about these three channels that we've discussed so far, they all transmit messages or data across space. So from one point in space to another point in space. But you can also have a channel that uh, transmits messages in time and keeps them at the same point in space. And we would call that a storage device. So if you, you know, if you 
store data on your hard drive or on your SSD, then um, you're basically sending it to your future self. And it really makes sense to, to treat uh, storage devices in the same framework because we will see that storage devices have a lot of the same properties that these you know, more typical channels that you would think of will have. So what are these properties? Again, a channel could be digital or analog. So for example, the uh, TCP and UDP are digital channels, but fiber optics are physical systems that, uh, where you have to measure something in analog. And also sound waves, when you talk to each other, are analog channels. Um, an important property of channels is that they can be noisy or noise-free. What do I mean with noisy? Well, a lot of channels don't really, um, in a lot of channels, the output isn't really exactly the same as the input. If you have a fiber optic cable, um, this fiber optic cable follows some physical process, so there will be some noise introduced along the way. And that means that Every once in a while, you measure something else at the end uh, than the thing that was put in, and you have to come up with a way to deal with that. Same for sound waves. Every once in a while, when I say something, you will not be able to hear me correctly, or you might even misunderstand it and you know think uh, think I was you might think that I was saying something different. Finally, uh, channel typically isn't it has some finite uh, transfer rate or in the lecture we will in one of the upcoming lectures we will introduce the term of a channel capacity and we'll define in more detail what that means in, 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 in the upcoming lecture but essentially it, the idea here is that a channel cannot transmit infinitely amounts of data in, in any times but it can only transfer kind of a finite amount of data per second. Okay, that's so much to the channel. Um, now let's talk about the reconstruction. So the kind of version of the message that the receiver reconstructed. The reconstruction can have different uh, properties. It can, it can have different kinds of reconstructions. For example, you could have, again, a computer file, but you can also have some sort of real-time playback and uh, you have, these have different constraints. For example, in real-time playback, um, if you don't get the right data in time, you may want to have to drop some frames. And that's not the same thing as if you receive a file. Another example would be, you know, let's consider again the case where the two of us are talking to each other and then the reconstruction, so the, the message is some, um, something that I thought of and the reconstruction will be just your comprehension kind of in your head. So the decoding step will be done in your head and then you will have some comprehension of the thing I wanted to express. What are the properties of the reconstruction? Well, um, the, an important property of um, the reconstruction is it can be either lossy or lossless. And there's a mistake here. Of course, this should say lossy or lossless. Um, so imagine you're sending an image file. Usually in an image file, if, you're, if it is a photo of something, then you're not expecting to get the exact same pixels uh, values back, but you're kind of, it's okay if, if uh, the image is kind of visually extremely, uh, visually very, very similar to the message that was put in in the beginning, but you might be okay with you know, some minor um, blurriness or minor um, uh, differences in colors. By contrast, if you have a text file, then you would usually want to have lossless you know, loss transmission, so you would usually expect that you will receive the exact same uh, text file that was put in in the beginning. Um, another property of the reconstruction could be, it could be um, a, in, done in a streaming or way, or what's also called progressive, or in bulk. What, what do I mean with that? Um, a, a, in a streaming reconstruction is often used for real-time playback. So uh, where, and here you expect that you can reconstruct parts of the message while you're still um, receiving more parts of, uh, uh, receiving the, the later parts. So if you're uh, streaming a video in a Zoom call or a Skype call, you expect to be able to reconstruct the first couple of frames before the later frames have even arrived. 
And by contrast, if you um, think about PDF, for example, I believe PDF has kind of its index typically at the end of the file. So it's kind of hard to read a PDF file unless you have really received the entire file, as far as I'm aware. Finally, a property of the reconstruction is it could be what I would refer to as seekable. So if you have, even if you have a bulk um, a reconstruction, it, depending on the uh, way you reconstruct the message, it may be, it, you may not be interested in the entire message and it may be easier or le less easy to just jump ahead to certain um, parts of the reconstruction. Okay, this, um, so far we've clarified three of the five components of our pipeline. Um, we'll, we'll be talking more about the encoding and decoding step, and this will actually be kind of main, the main part of this entire course. But before we talk about these, um, let's state what is actually the goal that we want to achieve. Our goal in this entire setup is that we want to transmit the message from the sender to the receiver, and we want to transmit it in, under two constraints. It should be fast and reliable. All right, I've now sketched out um, roughly the, the, the setup, the problem setting, and our goal. Now I would like to think you about um, what this goal means for the encoding and the decoding step, so what they have to do. And I've prepared three questions that I would encourage you to think about. The first question is, um, assume you want to losslessly transmit some message. So you want to, uh, you have, you're the, the sender has some message, and it wants to make sure that the uh, receiver transmits exactly the same message and they transmit it over some channel that they're both aware of. And let's assume that both the sender and the receiver know kind of the type of message. So they know whether it's an image or a video or an audio, something like this. And they are also aware of the properties of the channel. But obviously only the sender knows the precise instance of the message. The receiver doesn't know it yet. That's why we have to send it. Now let's assume that the message is represented as some string of n bits. So it could be an image file that you can represent as a string of bits or a text file. And again, both the sender and the receiver know which kind of, like, know how to interpret these n bits, but um, we'll just, you know, for now, for the purpose of this discussion, we'll just say it's a string of n bits. Now, of course, the sender has to encode the message and then the receiver has to decode the message. Now my question is, after encoding, what is the size of the message? And the options here are, could be either the same size, n bits, or it could be more than n bits, or less than n bits, or maybe it depends on the precise circumstances, what kind of message it is, what kind of um, channel it is. Second question is, what is really the task of the encoder and of the decoder then as well? So and we're first in the second question here going to consider the case where the channel uh, is noise free. So the channel, think of it something like TCP, like something, a, a channel that where you can be pretty sure that um, uh, the data that you get out is the, the exact same data that has the one that you put in. Now, what is really an, uh, the task of the encoding step? And in particular, um, you should think about our goal of transmitting um, over a channel with some finite capacity and transmitting this data as fast as possible. And then question three is now, um, let's make it a bit more complicated. Let's assume that um, now the, cha um, that, um, the channel introduces some sort of noise. So for example, it, if you have a digital channel, it might occasionally flip some bits randomly. And so now what additional tasks do the encoder and the decoder have to perform? Pause the video at this point and think about these questions and then I'll discuss them in a bit. All right, so here's what I would have answered. So in the first question, you know, assume that we have some message of n bits and we know the type of the message and the receiver knows the type of the message too, but it doesn't know the specific instance of the message. That's why we have to transmit it. And then the question is, what is the size of the message after encoding? Does it stay the same? Does it grow? Does it shrink? Or does it kind of depend on the circumstances? 
My answer would have been, it depends on the circumstances. And I'm going to, I'm not going to discuss this right now. We'll come back to this uh, later. Let's look at the other questions uh, first. Second question is, what do the encoder and decoder have to do if we have a noise-free channel and we have to want to transmit a message and in particular, we wanted to think about redundancies in the, in the data and about our goal of transmitting the messages as fast as we can. So um, if we want to transmit over a noise-free channel and um, we have some redundancies in the data, but the channel has kind of a finite capacity, then you know, if, the, if there are redundancies in the data, then we should try to get rid of them before we send the message over the channel. So for example, if you have an HTML file and you know that it will always start with the string HTML in angular brackets, then you may want to just strip those out and the, and the encoding side, and then the decoder will know that, you know, that it's, there will not, it will not be received kind of a starting HTML string, but it will know that it should be there so it can fill it back in because it's a redundant information. This is very trivial redundant information, but other redundant information could be in the English language, usually the letter Q is followed by the letter U. So you may, might want to think about introducing kind of a new virtual letter that's the letters Q and U together. And then anytime you see Q and U together, you just transmit that one letter, uh, which will um, be, will, may make it more efficient because then you have to transmit uh, less data over the channel. You then have a larger alphabet, you, you have more letters, but um, the, you will typically have to send fewer letters. Um, so this, so the, I have to repeat, the answer to question two would be um, that the goal, the, the task is to remove redundancies, remove redundancies. And this is called um, source coding or in another term for it is just compression. So this is source coding or compression. And the term source coding here has nothing to do with what we typically think of source code in, this, uh, in the uh, sense of uh, programming. Um, but we will understand in a second why this is called source coding. Now, question three was, what additional task um, do encoder and decoder have to perform if the channel introduces some random noise, for example, some random bit flips? And here, uh, my question would be the addition, and my answer would have been the additional uh, task that encoder and decoder have to perform is something that makes sure that despite the introduced noise by the channel, you are still able to decode the message um, without errors. And in order to do that, you typically have to add redundancies back in. Add redundancies. And this is then called channel coding. Coding. So let's um, take a uh, let's take a look back at our pipeline. So we're talking about the encoder and the decoder. And now what turns out is in general, encoding and decoding have to both remove redundancies and add redundancies. So they have to do both source coding and encoding. And it turns out that you can actually separate these steps from one from each other. And um, this is actually a very non-trivial result. Um, I'm not going to go into detail right now here because we're, this is actually a theorem that we will derive in one of the upcoming lectures. Um, at this point, I just want you to, to understand how this pipeline will typically, what this pipeline will typically look like in a real system. So in a real system, um, you have to start with your message and then your encoding step will typically consist of two steps. The first step will be um, what I called source coding, or what is generally called source coding. Source coding. And what this step does, it, it removes redundancies, it removes these 
uh, redundancies from the data. And the reason why we want to do this is because by removing redundancies, the message becomes shorter, so it will be cheaper to send over the channel. Uh, so another word for this is compression. And then after source coding, so after removing redundancies, now kind of seemingly paradoxically, you typically want to add back in some redundancies, and this is called channel coding. So this step adds redundancies. So um, now you may, may think, you know, why do I first remove redundancies just to then later add them back in? And the answer is these are different kinds of redundancies. The redundancies that you remove, they have, uh, they only depend on kind of this um, type of message. So you have, an, if you are, again, if you have an HTML file, then these redundancies result from the grammar of HTML. If you have a, a photograph, then the redundancies that you have there is that, you know, um, just listing the color values of every pixel is a very inefficient way to communicate photos. It's more efficient to, to talk in more semantic terms or in more, in, in shapes and things like that. Um, so, these redundancies that you're removing here, they only depend on the message. And that's why this, call is, this step is called source coding because it only looks at properties of the message. And we will actually see that it will actually require a probabilistic model of the data source, the data source that generates the message. On the other hand, channel coding, when it adds back in redundancies, it only looks at the properties of the channel. And we will actually see that it will require a probabilistic model of the channel. And it adds back adds different redundancies in the message um, that make it strategically so that um, even if the channel introduces some noise, you will still be able to decode the original message. So this is source coding and channel coding on the encoder side. Then on the decoder, it turns out you can also again um, separate these two uh, parts. So you would then start with channel coding or you can think of channel decoding. And this kind of channel coding looks at the message that it receives received from the channel. And it then takes into account properties of both the channel and it has to know what the channel coding process has been on the sender side. And it, it using these um, knowledge of these two facts, it uh, can detect when the channel introduced some noise. So when introduced, for example, a random bit flip. And this step is typically referred to as error correction. Or correction. Correction. And after errors have been corrected, we can then, we then get the kind of compressed message. So then we have to decompress it. And this is again called uh, source coding. So now we're doing the inverse of the source encoding step. So um, this is called uh, decompression. Again, I don't expect you to understand why uh, you can always um, separate the two steps in such a way and why in the source coding step, we only have to look at the message and in the channel coding step, you can ignore the message and we can only have to look at the channel. Um, or in the source, to be more precise, in the source coding step, we have to look at properties of the source that generated the message. And in the channel coding step, we can ignore the source of the message and we can only have, only have to take into account properties of the channel. I don't expect you to understand why that is the case. We will prove this in the lecture. But um, I um, want you to kind of get an idea of the typical um, framework of a, um, of a communication pipeline. And now with this knowledge, we can go back to question one. So question one was, if you have a message that you want to transmit, um, after encoding, does the message become bigger or like uh, longer or shorter? 
And I hope that now you can understand why I said the answer would, it depends because we have two steps in the encoding step and one step, the source coding step makes the message shorter because it removes redundancies, but then the channel coding step makes the message larger or longer because it adds back in new kinds of redundancies. And whether or not, you know, which one of these steps is, uh, has the bigger effect really depends on your situation. So if you have uh, highly redundant data, um, then you may have like extremely uh, high performing uh, compression and channel coding may only have a very low overhead. So then you would expect that the message after encoding is shorter than the original message. On the other hand, if you have a very noisy channel, let's imagine you're sending a signal to Mars, um, then you, ha you would expect that, you know, channel coding would have to add in a lot of redundancy so that you can still be somewhat um, uh, sure that you that at the end the receiver will get the correct message. All right, with this um, kind of uh, schematic sketch of the, the communication pipeline, I uh, would now like to you to think about, you know, more concrete examples of source coding and channel coding. In particular, I want you to think about um, these examples listed here. And for each one of these, um, I want you to uh, decide um, whether they are source coding or channel coding, or maybe a combination of, the, of both. And then um, I want, in question two here, I'm giving you a more concrete example. I'm showing you two QR codes. Um, you can try to scan both of them. And you can verify that they both um, uh, will, that you will go both, uh, that you will get the same text out of both of these QR codes. Um, but um, you will see that one of those QR codes is much larger than the other one. And to understand why that is the case, you could try to occlude parts of this QR code. So to um, occlude, for example, this part or this part. And you can uh, test how much you can occlude in each QR code and still be able to, um, to decode this, the correct message. Okay, think about these two questions and I'll be back in a second. All right, so here's what I would have answered. Um, SIP, GZIP and BZIP2, um, these are all compression methods and they are kind of um, universal compression methods that um, remove redundancies uh, in the form of repetitions that occur in the text. So they are all source coding. Source coding. Um, MP3, MP4, JPEG, uh, PNG um, are also compression methods. Um, they are specialized to particular uh, types of data like um, audio or video or images. Uh, but again, they remove redundancies that are particular redundancies in images. So also source coding. The phonetic alphabet is something that we use when we talk on the phone and we want to spell out something that's hard to, um, talk, to write or if the phone connection is poor. So if there's a lot of noise, but it's important that every letter of the thing that we want to say is uh, transmitted correctly. Like if, we're, um, if we are um, providing our names to um, some, um, some official um, government authority or something like this. Um, so here, instead of just saying the letters like uh, Robert, uh, sorry, just saying the, 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 the name that we want to say, like Robert, you replace every um, letter R, O and B with an entire word. So we're adding a lot of redundancies because if you um, then hear these uh, sequences of words, um, even if there's some noise on these words, you can still make out which word it was and you know with which letter it, uh, it begins. So we're adding a lot of redundancies so that we can still communicate over a very noisy channel. So this is channel coding. Uh, Morse code, I would argue is a combination of both. So Morse code is, um, consists of dots and dashes like long beeps and short beeps that we send over a very noisy channel. 
So it is these long and short beefs are optimized so that you can really distinguish them even in, uh, with, if you have a lot of noise. So that's kind of a channel coding aspect. But it also um, takes into account uh, the, has the t typical source of the message. So a typical source of the message is typically when you use Morse code, you would transmit or people used to transmit some sort of telegrams or some, some uh, natural language messages. Um, typically, in it, uh, when, when you think, for example, about the English language, then different uh, each letter has different um, uh, frequencies and Morse code actually assigns shorter code words or shorter um, sequences of uh, dots and dashes to letters that occur more often. And that is kind of a channel, uh, sorry, a, a source coding aspect because that allows us to compress messages that makes the messages shorter. So it is in some sense, it contains really both. Then the three digit C CVV on the back of your credit cards, it's the three digit number that you kind of sometimes have to provide to prove that it's really your credit card, that you really have it in your hand. Um, it really isn't, the main purpose of the CVV is really is neither channel coding nor source coding. It's really kind of a more of a cryptographic um, property, but it does also play the role of a sort of checksum. So if you mistyped one of the um, digits of your um, of your uh, of your longer of your twelve digit credit card number, and then um, the then very likely the CVV won't match. So that is some sort of error correction. Then the website or um, the call center that asks you for your credit card number can ask again and say, "I'm sorry, these numbers didn't match. Could you transmit that again?" So they can correct, they can detect and then correct the error. So it's, um, it has, has some uh, channel coding, coding aspect. But really it's more of a cryptographic um, uh, property. Emoji, I would argue are source coding because emoji allow you to um, express a, a sometimes even like a quite a complex um, emotion in just a single character. So that's uh, makes messages more compact. That's compression, that's source coding. And then the fact that QR codes like these ones are still readable, even if they are partially occluded. Well, that's um, the uh, prototypical example of channel coding because that's really error correction. And the reason why I included this uh, example is because I think this is a really interesting example where you really see uh, a very un atypical channel. So you can see that these uh, concepts that we're learning really apply in a very general setting. So here for these QR codes, the channel is kind of, you have light being reflected from the surface and then going through the optics of your phone camera. So that's that's the channel that we're thinking of here. We're not thinking about internet or uh, Bluetooth or anything like that. We're thinking about some optical channel that's somewhere situated in like a, a, a everyday environment. Um, so with that, we directly come to the second question. So um, I asked you kind of why do our do these two QR codes have such different size, even though they both encode the same data? And the reason is, um, as we uh, discussed already here, is that QR codes uh, contain some error correction. So they add some redundancy so that even if um, your reader doesn't, can't really make out all of the bit, all of the pixels, it can still decode the message usually. Um, and when you, create a QR code, you can actually decide how much error correction you will want to have. And the more error correction you add, the more resistant the QR code will be to, um, to um, occlusions or to, to misreads. So if you know that your QR code will appear in some very dirty environment, then you should add more error correction than if you know that your QR code will appear maybe in some factory where you have exact precise control over how things operate. And I think this is a very interesting example because you can already see some properties of these error correction codes. So for example, in a QR code, uh, 
it's very unlikely that like random bits here, 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 and here are flipped. What's more likely is that um, you have an occlusion, like uh, you have something that's in front of it. And so uh, uh, it's likely that the bits or the, the, the pixels that are misread by a reader are kind of um, uh, close to each other in some region. And so the error correction that has to be included in a QR code has to kind of uh, be optimized for these kind of expected um, uh, expected errors. So um, you need kind of, in, more generally speaking, for error correction, you need a model of your channel um, and then optimize the error correction code for that model. All right, in this lecture, we will not talk too much about error correction. It will come up at some point, but most of the time we will talk only about source coding. Um, so we will assume in a sense that we have a channel that is noise free so that we can um, that w a channel where we can input some some in some uh, compressed data and then the receiver will receive exactly the same compressed data and it can then decompress that um, why can we still assume that i mean in the end, all channels that we were going to use are going to be some physical system. So there's always noise in a physical system. But why can we still use such a um, model of a perfect channel? Well, the reason is precisely, you can see the reason precisely in this diagram. So since we can separate source coding from channel coding, and since the channel coding is kind of close to the channel, we can now um, uh, use a common trick in computer science that you know, computer science is about building abstractions, building useful abstractions. So we can say, well, yes, maybe on the physical level we have a noisy channel, but we can add some channel coding and then we can define kind of this group of things as kind of our channel prime. And then this channel channel prime is uh, for all intents and purposes uh, noise free and we will prove in this lecture and this is a, um, uh, a, a non-trivial result that you can actually uh, come arbitrarily close to really perfect noise free at a finite cost at least for very long messages All right, so this kind of sets the scene and this actually sets the scene for the entire course that we're going to go, um, go through. Um, so in, for this entire course, we will be considering the, the situation where we have a sender and a receiver and they want to send a message. And in order to do that, they have to encode that message. And in particular, we are interested in the source coding step of the encoding and decoding. So the one that removes redundancies on the encoding side and then adds them back in on the decoding side so that you get a reconstruction and that reconstruction could be lossless or lossy. With that, now let's come to our first class of actual compression uh, methods. And this first class of compression methods are called symbol codes. And these are really compression methods that are um, used a lot in practice. So for example, gzip and bzip2 and these things, they all use symbol codes under the hood, combined with some additional tricks. Um, so in this lecture, we will kind of set the general framework. And then in the next uh, video, we will um, use this general framework to derive both a theoretical result and an actual algorithm. So the theoretical result will be um, a very fundamental lower bound on the optimal compression performance that you could possibly get for lossless compression. And then the practical result will be that you can actually come arbitrarily close to this, um, um, that there are actually um, algorithms that can come arbitrarily close to the, these um, this lower bound, uh, at least in some um, um, cases. Um, uh, and that's what we will be discussing in the next video. Um, but for this video, let's first set the uh, stage for simple code. So uh, the problem setting that we're concerned with he here is that we want to communicate over a noise-free channel. So we assume that we already have this abstraction um, that error correction is already, the channel coding is already taken care of. So we have can think of a noise-free channel. 
and uh, we assume that this sender has some message and I'm going to den donate, uh, denote the message as x underlined, so x underlined is the message, and it wants to transmit this message losslessly, so we're considering lossless compression to a receiver and it wants to use as few bits as possible. So with lossless compression, what I mean with that is that we have this message and our goal is that the receiver can receive this exact same message without any, um, without any um, deviations. Um, so just to fix some notation, we are going to denote the encoder as some function C star that takes the message X underlined and it uh, will map it to C star of X and the C star is a string of bits. So this uh, uh, asterisk here is, uh, that's called the cleanest star. So what this basically means, you take this set of, you know, zero and one bits and you form the set of kind of all possible strings that you can form with this of all arbitrary lengths. So a code word could be mapped to um, the empty string. That's a very unusual case. Uh, but it could be also be mapped to a string of bits, sorry, a, a symbol, a, a sequence of symbols, and a message uh, could be mapped to a, a, um, a sequence of an arbitrary length sequence of arbitrary bits. That's what this notation means. More generally, so here we're concerned with bits. Usually we we'll use binary codes, but more generally you can th also think of, extend this to, um, you know, codes with more than one kind of BRE codes, not binary, but BRE codes, where the set of, instead of just zero and one bits, you have more possibilities on your channel. Uh, for example, Morse code, as we will see, is kind of a tertiary code. But most of the time, we'll commonly use capital B equals two. So, you know, um, codes that, uh, that uh, map your message to a string of bits. Okay, so this is the general setup of lossless compression. Now, what are symbol codes in particular? Symbol codes are satisfy all of these um, requirements, but they add some additional constraints. The first constraint is a constraint on the message. And here we are assuming that the message is a sequence of symbols. So the message, I'm going to denote this as X underlined and the symbols as normal x sub i, so x sub i from, and we are going to assume that these symbols all come from some discrete alphabet, capital or uh, x. Um, so the notation for that will be the message x unaligned is a, a sequence or a tuple of symbols x1, x2 to xk, where k is some integer, the length of the message. And I'm also going to sometimes just call this x sub i for i from one to k. And then here, I, each of these xi, we are going to call them symbols, um, is from a, an element from this uh, finite alpha or this discrete alphabet. And um, what I mean with discrete is that this alphabet is either finite or countably infinite. For the most part, you can just think of the alphabet as being finite. So think of, for example, when you're transmitting uh, a text from natural language, then the alphabet would be the letters from A to Z and maybe the space and some uh, full stop or something like that. Um, the countably infinite part um, uh, actually becomes important in some machine learning setups when you want to um, represent uh, or approximate real numbers, but um, for the most part, you can think of um, the alphabet of being finite. And then, so this is the first um, constraint that's specific to symbol codes, that the message is kind of a sequence of symbols from the same alphabet. And then the second constraint is, um, and that's really the more important constraint here, is that um, this encoding function, C star, this has a very simple form. And the very simple form is um, when we have a message that's a sequence of symbols, we just go iterate over each symbol in the sequence, and we are going to um, look up what we're call, calling a code word for that symbol, and then we're just, so this each of these is a bit string, and then we're just going to con concatenate them to a single long bit string. So again, so C here, these Cs without the star, you call them the code book 
And this codebook kind of contains for every symbol in our alphabet, it contains what we call a code word for that symbol. And then we make one additional definition that um, L of X, uh, we denote that as the length of um, the code word. So with length, we typically mean number of bits, or if we have a binary code, then it's in a number of binary um, bits. Kind of word. I don't know what this would be called then. All right, these are symbol codes. Let's um, proceed with a couple of examples. And that's here. So um, the first example, I kind of already mentioned it, is uh, Morse code. And Morse code is really a kind of binary code with B equal three because it kind of each letter is um, mapped to a sequence of dots and dashes, but then also between letters, you have to add a pause to distinguish um, a letter. So you have kind of three uh, states of your channel. Um, okay. Slightly more modern symbol code would be UTF-8. So UTF-8 is kind of when you have a text file on your computer, like an HTML file or a LaTeX file, uh, it will typically nowadays be represented in, or encoded in UTF-8. Uh, this is again a binary code. And um, so this is just the way how letters and special characters and things like that are mapped to bytes or therefore sequences of bits. So here, you know, Alphabet is the set of all Unicode code points. So basically you can, you can think of this as letters, uh, punctuation marks, and all kinds of special characters. And, and also um, letters from uh, different alphabets than Latin. Um, and then the code word of any, let of any symbol in that alphabet is just the UTF-8 representation of X, which is uh, standardized somewhere and uh, the length of each code word is uh, it utf-8 always maps to a full sequence of bytes so it's either 8 16 24 32 32 bits that is so either one two three or four bytes so this is a kind of very co uh, widely used example of a symbol code and then the third example is uh, somewhat more kind of a made up example, but this will be um, an example that we will use in, uh, in many of the upcoming uh, videos uh, to kind of play around with symbol code. So this will be a less useful um, system, uh, less useful code, but it will be one that we can, where we can very easily intuitively understand some important things that are going on here. And I'm going to call this the simplified game of monopoly. And this is not a standard term. This is just a term that I came up with here. So what do I mean with that? Uh, let's say we have a pair of dice and we throw, throw the pair of dice. And after the throw, we add together, you know, we have two dice. So we add together the numbers that they show like you do in monopoly. And then we just write down the sum as the new symbol XI. So if we have a message of five symbols, then we throw the pair of dice for the first time, we write down that number, the, the sum of the numbers, then we throw them for the second time, we write down the sum of the numbers, and then we do this five times, and then we get these five numbers. And so just, you could do this with regular six-sided dice, but then we will, later on, we will um, uh, write out tables for all kinds of combinations that you would get, and th that would be very tedious. So let's just make our lives simpler, and let's just assume that we have three-sided dice. So dice that can each one of the pair of dice, each die can only take the numbers one, two, or three, and therefore their sum can only be two, three, four, five, or six. So you would get a two if you have. The only way to get a two is if both dies are uh, one, so that would be a one plus one. You could get a three if you know one of them is one and the other one is two, or if it's the other way around, and so on. And you would get a six if both of them are three. That's the only way in this, with these three-sided dice, get a number six. Okay, this may seem like kind of a silly game, 
but it will really make it easier to think about um, some important concepts and it will visually uh, like exemplify a lot of the important concepts that play a role in compression. Um, so in order to understand that, let's think about some symbol codes that we can uh, design. Let's assume that we have a sequence of these numbers from this alphabet. Let's say we have five of these numbers from this alphabet and we want to transmit them to some receiver. And the receiver knows that what they're going to um, receive is such a sequence from our simplified game of Monopoly, but they don't know the specific instance of the sequence. They don't know the specific numbers. So how could we map these such a sequence of numbers to a string of bits um, in such a way that the receiver can then decode that? Okay, the first thing that you might come up with is, okay, let's construct a code book that Again, a code book assigns to each of these symbols. Here assigns a, a bit string. And let's, the first thing that you might come up with is, you know, these are all numbers, so they have some binary representation. Let's just write down that binary representation. Um, so let me do this down here. Um, I've prepared some table. So in this simple example, you would have um, your code book, um, the binary representation of two is one zero, the binary representation of three is one one, then you get one zero zero, one zero one, one one zero. Okay, this could be one naive example, but then you would see, oh, I start already kind of with a two, um, two bit code word, but really, I mean, the symbols zero and one aren't even really possible. Um, why don't I just subtract two from each of them and then I encode the binary representation? So that would lead to our next kind of candidate symbol code. And we'll discuss whether that's a useful idea or not in a second, but let's just do that for now. So then if we just take write down the binary representation of the symbol minus two, we would get zero for the number two, number three, we get one, then for the number symbol four, we get two, which in binary representation is one, zero, then one, one, and then uh, one, zero, zero. Um, if you look at this code, you will already, might already guess that there's, this is probably not going to work. And the reason why this might not work is, um, how do I know if, if I get a one zero, how do I know that this is a four and not a three two, right? Because it could either be this symbol or it could be the concatenation. Remember, we, con we are going to concatenate all these symbols, but it could, be the, it could also be the concatenation of these two symbols. Um, so a simple fix for this issue uh, that you could think of is that, you know, let's just pad with initial zero bits. So let's just say, uh, the symbol, uh, the, the code word for the symbol three is three times zero. So longest symbol here is three. So we have to pad to three bits. Then we have zero, zero, one, uh, zero, one, zero, zero, one, one, and one, zero, zero. Then we don't have, whenever we get a message, we can always divide it into chunks of three bits and we can uniquely decode it. But it will, the message will become longer. So now we can think of, okay, could we not, not still kind of make it shorter for some of the symbols? And I'm going to just propose two um, code books here and we will then discuss whether they are useful or not. So the first one I'm going to propose is this one and this one, uh, this one, this one, and then this one. So zero, one, zero, one, zero, 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 one, one, and zero. One, one. And then um, I'll also propose an alternative code book that is zero, one, zero for the symbol two, um, zero, one for the symbol three, um, zero, zero for the symbol four, one, one for the symbol five, and uh, one, one, zero for the symbol six. Now we have five different candidate code books that we could use either one of these 
to encode a sequence of these symbols. Now I want you to, to pause the video again and you would, I would like to rank, I would like you to rank these code words by usefulness. So I would like you to tell me which of these code words is most useful and which of these code words is least useful. And as a reminder, ultimately our goal is not to transmit a single uh, symbol, two, three, four, five, or six, but our goal is really to transmit a sequence of these symbols. Um, and in particular, uh, we want to transmit them in as few bits as possible. So pause the video again and think about which one is the most useful and which one is the least useful video, uh, symbol, uh, code book. All right, let's get back to it. So here's what I would have answered. Um, first of all, we kind of already discussed that um, the code book C2 is not useful because um, you won't be able to uh, reliably decode um, the message that the encoder encoded. Let's assume the encoder encoded the message uh, just consisting of a single symbol four, which is one zero, then the decoder might think that's the sequence of symbols three zero. Um, or the encoder may encode this, uh, the message uh, sequence of symbols, um, let's say um, five three, so that would be one one one. Then the decoder may think, okay, it might be five three or it might be three five. So it, even if it even if the decoder knows the uh, length of the um, the sequence, it will still not be able to distinguish these two clashing um, examples. Um, so this is certainly kind of not very useful. So let me just strike this too. Um, what about C1? For C1, it's not that obvious, but I would also argue that this is a not a very useful um, code. Um, let's imagine you have uh, a message, an encoder that encodes the message. Um, is this visible? Um, consisting of the um, symbols two, six, so two symbols, two, six, then C star, so the encoded form of this message would be two gives you one, zero, and then six is one, one, zero. But then the decoder could think that could group um, the symbols in a different way. It could first read off the first three bits and then say, okay, this is um, the symbol five, one, zero, one, followed by the symbol two. So you have, again, two different sequences, even though each individual symbol is mapped to a different code word. But once you concatenate them, you have two different sequences that are mapped to um, the same encoding, the same bit string. So this is also, I would argue, a not very useful uh, code uh, book. Um, now C3 clearly um, doesn't have this problem. Whenever you get a message that's encoded with C3, you know that it will, it, the number of bits in this message, in this encoded message is a multiple of three. So you can divide it into blocks of three. And then for each block, you can just decode that block into its original symbol. So that's surely a useful simple code. But um, uh, sorry, yeah, useful symbol code, a useful code book, but it's not optimal. So it has some overhead. It's it will lead to longer uh, messages than really necessary. Um, and it turns out that C4 and C5 are also valid code books. So you can convince yourself that um, none of these that there's no way that in which you will. Um, in which you can uh, introduce a clash between two different sequences, the, between the encoding of two different sequences in either codebook C4 and codebook C5. And we'll discuss the reason for this in the next lecture and in the next video. Um, but if you just trust me for a second, then I would argue that C4 and C5 are a bit more useful than C3 because C4 and C5 
lead to shorter messages, so they are more efficient. All right, that wraps up this first video. In the next um, video, we will um, derive some properties of, we will derive some ways and how you can see whether um, symbol codes are useful or not. We will derive, the, we will define the property of uniquely decodability, unique decodability. And um, we will derive some properties that unique decodable, uniquely decodable symbol codes have to, um, have to satisfy. And with these properties, you can immediately see that uh, both of these codes are not uniquely decodable, so not useful. And you don't even have to come up with like examples of where things clash. You can immediately see that certain inequality is not satisfied, so they cannot be valid code, uh, valid uniquely decodable code books. And then we will um, derive a, um, a, a, a quantity that um, poses the um, theoretical bound for the expected uh, number of bits that you would get for kind of a randomly drawn message. And we will then de um, derive a practical algorithm that can get very close to this expected, this theoretical bound for the expected length of an encoded message. And that will be the, the famous Huffman coding algorithm. So we will uh, both prove the theorem on the lower bound for lossless compression, and that's a lower bound for any compression method that you'll have, not just for symbol codes and not just for Huffman coding. And then we will actually derive a code that in some sense comes close to this um, lower bound. And that's in the next lecture. On the problem set, which uh, you can find a link to in the video description, you will play around a bit more with these um, code books and um, you will um, argue, think a little bit more about what this, um, this procedure of how we created these, these symbols, what influence that has on the choice of, um, of code words that you may want to do. And you may then understand why I chose kind of shorter code words for these inner symbols and longer code words for these more kind of extreme symbols. And then um, and the, as the second uh, problem on the problem set, you will actually implement both an encoder and a decoder, a very naive version, but a version that will work for such simple codes. And you will be able to test that these um, and your implementations will actually work on um, real data. And with that, see you in the next video.